Welcome back. This is part three of the chapter 16 apes lecture. Uh, and we pick up on 16.3 where we're looking at how we can slow climate change. Um, the nice thing is it's nothing new. It's the same things we've been talking about all year long. Reduce, reuse, recycle essentially. Uh, if we cut waste and rely on new renewable energy resources, we can do all the things listed on the screen. Uh, one of the frustrating parts of environmental science is that it seems like we have a never-ending list of issues that we're constantly fighting. One of the promising things is that a lot of those things are fixed with the same solution. If we cut waste, switch to renewable energy resources, so many of these issues resolve themselves. But it's a very complex long-term political problem because it involves some haves and some have-nots. Um, it involves unequal use of resources. It involves reducing fossil fuels um, and, and that's you know, controversial in some places and impractical in others because it's just not financially practical that some some developing countries can switch to uh, or can start up something like wind energy if they don't have a, a uh, the infrastructure for non-renewable energy resources in place. So it takes some some fossil fuels to get to sustainability. So the the challenge is, can we do that as a global community. Can in th those of us in the developing world help those, I'm sorry, those of us in the developed world help those in the developing world to leapfrog some of these mistakes that we've made. Uh, mitigation is the idea that uh, we're going to try to uh, reduce the severity of the problem. That's where we try to remove more carbon dioxide rather than reducing the amount that we publish, uh, publish that we put out. Um, and then adaptation, find ways to adapt to changes, um, you know, in, in, in the climate itself. Uh, so there are some tipping points that we need to be aware of. This 450 parts per million is a really big one, and I would definitely make sure I commit that one to memory for the AP exam. Uh, melting of all the Arctic summer sea ice is a melting point. Uh, I'm sorry, a tipping point. Tipping points are the point of no return. It's really important that we understand what, what a tipping point is and, and what some of these are. Uh, once these things happen, there's kind of no going back. Once the Greenland ice sheet melts, it's gone. Uh, I saw on the news recently that there's only one area of Greenland that still has an ice sheet attached to it in the summertime. So that's alarming. Uh, collapse and melting of most of the western Antarctic ice sheet. Massive release of methane from thawing Arctic permafrost in the, from the Arctic sea floor. Again, as melting happens, uh, it, it's sort of a positive feedback feedback loop. Collapse of part of the Gulf Stream, severe ocean acidification, uh, massive loss of coral reefs, severe shrinkage, or collapse of the Amazonian rainforest. And again, these tipping points are where all the momentum takes over. So how do we slow climate change? Uh, reduce greenhouse gas emissions for sure would help. Cut fossil fuels would help with that. Improve energy efficiency, things like Energy Star appliances and things like that. Shifting to renewable energy resources, of course, would, would help dramatic, dramatically. dramatically. Uh, reduce deforestation, use more sustainable ag and forestry. Um, and, and certainly, some groups are working to reduce their carbon footprints and, and more and more are realizing the importance in doing so. We need to act as individuals. We need to influence our companies. We need to influence our cities and our states and our country to be better has to start somewhere, so it might as well start with me. Um, some geoengineering um, potential solutions would be uh, carbon capture and storage. What, these are ways that we can remove carbon dioxide and then sequester it somewhere and store it somewhere. Um, and then geoengineering is basically uh, strategies to uh, manipulate the conditions to counter the greenhouse effect. So and engineer the, the planet so that we uh, can mitigate some of these issues. Um, here are some of the carbon capture storage uh, ideas. We could uh, pipe, we could pump some of the CO2 into depleted coal beds, down into saltwater aquifers. Uh, we could pump things down this way uh, into the CO2. You see here, mostly we're piping that onto land and then down into the uh, seawater aquifer. Um, so there are places that we can store uh, this this kind of stuff. You want to make sure that you check out the um, uh, 
picture on 554, it looks a lot like this. Um, and it's got several of these geoengineering examples. Uh, make sure you look at that before the test. So what can governments do to help overcome this? Well, we need to strictly regulate methane and CO2. We need to phase out coal burning power plants, tax carbon and methane emissions, and start energy taxes. Use a cap and trade system. If you don't understand that yet, make sure you do before test day. Phase out tax breaks and subsidies for fossil fuel industries. Like I, I've said many times this year, we should incentivize the future, not subsidize the past. We, if we want to make something cheap, let's make it cheap to be responsible for the planet, not make it cheap to pollute the planet. And then increase development of alternatives like alternative energy and things along those lines. If you notice, when we looked at the Paris Agreement, that's pretty much what this stuff was trying to accomplish, or, or this stuff is pretty much what the Paris Agreement was trying to accomplish. Most of the countries of the world agreed to do these things uh, to fight climate change. So what can we do? Well, we've done this. We, we know our carbon footprint. Do things to help improve your carbon footprint. Use Energy Star appliances. Reduce garbage. Walk, bike, carpool. Use mass transit. All these things we've been talking all year We've been framing them as ways to help with water, help with soil. But really, when you help the environment, you're going to help the whole environment. You're going to help climate change. You're going to help water pollution, air pollution, soil degradation. All these things are going to go along if you just try to be better tomorrow than you were today. How can we reduce ozone depletion specifically? Uh, basically, we need to use fewer chemicals that are going to degrade our ozone layer. Uh, and this is one area that we've had some success uh, since the 70s when, when the hole in the ozone layer was at its peak. Um, but ozone is great for us because it blocks UV radiation um, and, and keeps some of that UV radiation from coming to Earth and, and essentially causing astronomical uh, cancer rates. Uh, it stems from, our, our thinning anyway, th stems from the use of CFCs uh, known as freons, that should sound familiar to you. I told you a story about Freon used for coolants and air conditioning. So we outlawed Freon as a air conditioning uh, strategy in the 90s. And we switched to a, a different chemical. That helped immensely. Uh, but it, it, that's not the only use for Freon. We used to use them in a lot of aerosol cans and things along those lines. Like the hairspray that, that my grandma used in the 70s and 80s had, had some Freon in it that, that shot made that shoot out of the can. Um, ozone thinning allows more UV radiation to come to the Earth's surface. Uh, I mentioned skin cancer uh, rates, but it also increased cataract issues in, in eyes. Um, and then it impairs and destroys phytoplankton. So we tend to think about you know, our human-centric viewpoint uh, that it causes uh, skin cancer rates to increase. And, and definitely it does, but it's also going to mess up something at the base of many marine food chains. So that's always troublesome. So in 1987... The Montreal Protocol was established, and the Copenhagen Agreement followed up in 1992 and was a similar kind of thing. Uh, but it set goals to, to phase out CFCs and other ozone-depleting chemicals, and it's starting to recover. Uh, in the last 10 or 15 years, we've seen uh, the ozone layer starting to fill itself back in. This is a great example of how countries can work together, um, the kind of the, the basis for the Paris Climate Agreement. Now, if, if all of the world's countries would adopt it and agree to it and ratify it, and implement those changes, maybe we won't cross those tipping points that we saw uh, a few slides ago. But if nothing happens globally, and especially if the United States and China and India don't agree to lead the way on this stuff, we're in trouble. And, and that's probably nothing new. That's the kind of thing we've been talking about all year long. But this really, the, the reason I like to leave this unit to the last is it really brings all this stuff into focus. Everything that we've talked about all year long is contributing to climate change one way or another. And if we can address all of these issues, we might have a shot. If not, maybe not. That's chapter 16.